Now back at the start, I listed a series of skills you needed to be able to do with the assembly code instructions in order to pass the assessment. These were to design, write, test and refine the assembly code. But what do these skills actually look like? Design and write can be grouped together because they're a very similar skill. There's some argument that they could ask you to design assembly code using something like a flowchart, but I think that's less likely than asking you to actually write a program from scratch and would actually be reasonably difficult because the constructs of a flowchart assume that you're using high level code. The problem is that in past papers and even the old specification, the historical ones, we've never actually seen a question on this topic in the practical exam. What we might see is something like this, a question that asks us to design a program that adds the values 42 and 58 together and outputs the result. How do we tackle designing and writing that code? Well, first things first, we know all the instructions. So let's go through what we've been asked to do one step at a time and convert that into assembly instructions. The questions mention having the two numbers stored in memory. So the first thing we'd need to do is to load the first number. At this point, don't worry yourself about the operands. We'll do that in the second pass. After loading one number from memory into the accumulator, we should be able to use the add instruction to add another data value from a different memory location to the accumulator value. The question tells us to output the answer once it's calculated, so this is the OUT instruction. It also mentions that it wants the program to terminate. That's our control mnemonic, HALT, H-L-T, to halt the program. Now once we've halted the program, that's a good point to put the data instructions in. As we're adding these values together, it doesn't really matter what order, so I'll just put 42 here and 58 here. Now with the program written, go to the left-hand side and add the line numbers of all the instructions. Start with one, then go to two, and, uh, and go from there. It's reasonably straightforward. And with this done, it makes adding the operands of any instructions that need them so much easier. Load needs an operand. It needs to be told which data value to load. Now, we know where the first of those data values is. It's on line five, so you pop in five as the operand there. Add also needs an operand. With 42 in memory, we need to add it to the number 58, which is in the memory location six. So pop six in as the operand. That's it done. Well, let's try that method again, but with something that's a bit more complex. As soon as a question involves input of more than one value, the complexity of the question increases massively with the topic. Still, let's apply the method to it. We start by breaking it down and turning the question into a series of instructions in the right order. Then we'll add line numbers and finally pop those line numbers where they're needed in the operands. The question wants us to take the input of two different numbers then subtract the second number from the first and output the result on screen. And there's a little knack to doing this that's hinted at in the last sentence. The result should be stored in a separate memory location. So if we're taking the input for two values and storing them, we need two lots of input and two lots of store straight after each other. With that done, we'll need to get the first value back into the accumulator. So a load would be next. We then do the subtraction, then output it to the screen, and then store the result in memory. Now the last two steps, it doesn't really matter the order you do those two, but that's the order they were asked in the question, so we'll do it in that order. With the program itself done, we'll halt it, which then lets us put in our data instructions, and we need a place to store both input numbers and the result. If we're doing placeholders, the normal thing is to use dat0 to literally store the value 0 in memory. Second step, put your line numbers in. Third step, identify all the instructions that need operands and write in the correct line numbers. So STA on line 2 needs the location we want to save that value to. Uh, let's stick that in the first dat line, that's line 10. On line 4, we've got the same thing, but for the second number, so we'll pop 11 in there, as that's the second dat location. Line five wants us to load the first number back up again, so we'll put 10 there, because that's where we stored it. Subtract needs one, because we need to subtract the second number from the first, so we'll put 11 in there. And finally, we're storing the answer on line eight, so let's store that in the third DAT location on line 12. So writing assembly code takes a bit of practice, but there'll be links below to my website where you can find some example questions to practice with, and it is just a case of practice, practice, practice. The more you do, the more confident you'll be in writing simple assembly programs. The other skill 
being able to test assembly code can only really be assessed by asking you to work through a trace table for the code execution. Now this is a massive amount of effort and even a small program like we've got here leads to a huge table. So a question like this would have to be crafted with care to make sure it isn't overwhelming in an exam situation. Now here's one I've knocked up. It asks you to produce a trace table for a program that outputs the three times table. Now it specifically asks you to only produce the table for three iterations of the code. Now they would need to tell you that because when you use the branch instruction to go back to another part of the code, it's exactly the same as an infinite loop. Because of this, they'll need to tell you how many times around the loop you're expected to go. We'll keep an eye on this as we go. So, what does a trace table look like for assembly code? Well, a trace table allows you to follow the execution of code line by line and how the execution changes the variables. In assembly, we need a column for the line number, column for the value of the accumulator, and one for the output, at the very least. If there are any variables or data locations that are being saved to, we'll probably need to record those too. Uh, luckily, that's not happening this time. Let's leap into line one. It's a load instruction from line six. So the value zero is being placed in the accumulator. Note there's no output. So rather than leave it blank, I've put a little line through it just to show that it's not being forgotten. On to line two. It's an add instruction, so the contents of line 7 is added to the accumulator. That's a sum of 3 plus 0, so the answer to that, 3, is left in the accumulator after the execution. Line 3 is a nice output command, so the value of the accumulator is output at this point. We encounter a branch instruction on line 4, which you remember only impacts the program counter. Now, as we haven't got that down as a heading, nothing really changes on this line, but the next line we write about will be line 2, as it's branched us to line 2. We then need to add the content of line 7 to the accumulator, so that's 3 plus 3, it's 6, and that's what goes into the accumulator. Line 3 is output, then line 4 branches back to line 2 again. Now this is our third time through the loop, the third iteration, so this will be the last one that we need to document. Adding 3 to the accumulator again gives us 9, and that's the output, and then the branch instruction pushes us back. If we look at the trace table, we've got all three iterations done, so that means we're finished. It is just manually going through the execution of the code line by line and following along. And whilst it should be really straightforward, it can trip you up if you don't take your time and understand how all of the instructions are working. Let's go to a more complex example. In this one, I've even snuck in labels, which actually makes this process a little easier, despite making most people freak out for a second. In this question, you're being asked to test two iterations of the code. We've also been asked to keep track of a few of the variables, which are referenced by their labels. So let's start by constructing the headings for the trace table. We'll need the line number, accumulator, and the output as before, but we also need to include temp1, temp2, and the total variable, because they were specifically mentioned in the question. We'll start at line one, and just remember that the labels are just making it easier for us to work out which line number we care about. Once this input command has been executed, the accumulator contains the number three. This is the first input the question mentioned. Whilst the variables temp1 and temp2 are dat0, meaning a value of zero, just take a look at their labels on line 11 and 12. The total variable is on line 13, starts as 25, and there is no output at this point. Line two is telling us to store the value of the accumulator in temp one, okay, we'll do that. The only thing that changes on this line is that temp one now contains the number three. The next line is another input command. This time, the question has said that 21 would be the input, which ends up in the accumulator. Line four stores the value into temp two, so that value changes to 21 as well. We're next going to load the value from total into the accumulator, meaning that its new value is 25. The add instruction on line 6 will add the value of temp1 to what's in the accumulator, meaning 25 plus 3, giving us a final value of 28 in the accumulator. Line 7 is a subtract which takes away the value of temp2 from the accumulator. This sum of 28 minus 21 gives us the answer 7, which is stored in the accumulator again. The next line is a nice, simple output. So the current value of the accumulator is just shown on the screen. Line 9 tells us to store the value from the accumulator in the total variable, so that becomes 7 
And line 10 is a branch instruction to send us back to the start, which is line one. No data changes in this line as it controls the program counter, which we've not been tracking in our trace table. Back to the start again to line one, where we are taking input again. The question is asked for 17 to be the value here, which goes into the accumulator. We then have to store that in temp one, so that becomes the value from the accumulator, 17. Another input, according to the question, we should be using the number two there, which goes into the accumulator, fantastic. We're then storing it in temp two, so that becomes the value two as well. On line five, we're loading the value of total into our accumulator. Total is currently seven, so that becomes the value of the ACC as well. Line six asks us to add the value of temp one to the accumulator. That's seven plus 17, giving us 24 to store back in the accumulator. Then we're on to our subtract instruction, asking us to take the value of temp two away from the accumulator. That's 24 minus two, giving us 22 to put back into the accumulator. An output command on line eight outputs the value of the accumulator and that's just 22. We store that 22 then in the total with line nine store instruction. Then we branch again back to line one and that's the end of our second iteration. Yes, we've been around the loop twice. So that's really all testing is. It's working through the code line by line and applying the instructions to the data set you've been asked to work with. The last skill on our list is to refine the assembly code. Now, given that we've never seen any of these questions in a GCSE practical exam before, what exactly do they mean by refine? Luckily, a quick Google defines refine as a verb that has two meanings, removing impurities or unwanted elements and making minor changes to improve something. Translated to the world of programming, this means the process of refinement is removing useless code and then making changes to the code to improve it. Let's use our original Fibonacci generator code as an example. Now at this point, if you were shouting at the video a few minutes ago, you might see why. Let's see if we can try and refine it. You remember that a Fibonacci number is calculated by adding up the previous two numbers in the sequence, starting with zero and one and going on from there. Looking at this 11 line program, is there any useless code in there that we can remove? Well, it's worth taking a look at line nine, the halt instruction. Now the code will never actually reach that line. Why is that? Well, just before it on line eight, we're telling the code to branch back to line one. So every time the assembler reaches line eight, it will immediately shoot back to line one and poor old line nine will never ever be fetched, decoded or executed. Sad times for line nine. But if we're trying to refine it, we need to find and remove lines that don't have any impact on the program. And this is an ideal candidate. So let's get rid of it. If we remove a line, we have to move everything below it up into the space it occupied. We can't leave a blank line in assembly code. But as soon as we do that, it causes problems because it changes the line numbers of the data, the DAT instructions. So we need to find any references to line 10 and change them to the new location line nine. Likewise, we'll go through and find any references to line 11 and change that to that new location on line 10. We've refined our code partially now. It's one line more efficient. And you might be thinking, removing one line is hardly worth it. And yes, to an extent that's true, but what if by removing that line, the entire program could now be stored in main memory? instead of it being swapped back and forth. Well, that would speed up the program enormously. It's always worth doing just in case. What about the second kind of refinement then? Well, making changes to improve code is all about finding parts of the code where we're repeating things or that we can cut out. Often this is done during looping because usually what's happening in a loop is that we're moving back to an earlier piece of the code but this time when we arrive there, we already have a value stored in the accumulator that might be relevant. Now this is the case here because when the branch instruction on line eight sends us back to line one, we're loading the value from memory that's already in the accumulator. Now this is a bit of a waste of time because we're pretty much wasting one instruction per cycle. If we just change the branch instruction to take us to line two instead, 
where the actual work is being done, then we remove one instruction per iteration. So there we have it. Our program becomes one instruction shorter in code and runs one less instruction per iteration, meaning that it will run faster overall. That's all there really is to refinement. It's about spotting areas where you can make a saving in the length of code of instructions per iteration. This will take practice, but if you look for halt instructions immediately after jumps, they can usually be removed. And then you can look for a branch command that sends you back to a load rather than actually to doing something with the data. And then you're starting from a good place, especially given the limited instruction set that you're dealing with. I've saved the best for last and now here's the really disappointing bit of this entire lesson. You may never actually see this topic being covered in the practical exam. Now, whilst theoretically they should ask questions about this topic once every three years at the very least, there is an overlap with some of the content in the written exam, meaning they can probably justify away not asking questions about it in the practical exam. And actually that seems to have been what has happened for many years in the older specification. But why? Well, let's take another look at the instruction set. They've asked you to learn all of these. And specifically, let's have a look at that branch instruction. There's no way of adding a condition to that branch instruction. What that means is that we can't build any if statements. We can't write anything other than infinite loops if we use it, as you will have seen in all my examples. Then we're stuck with programs that loop forever, which are difficult to write questions about. Or we're writing programs that are almost sarcastically simple, adding two numbers together, that sort of thing. That really doesn't feel like a worthwhile use of the topic. Their instruction set is too simple to build meaningful programs to ask lengthy questions about. So, after all that, you might not ever see this question in the practical part of the exam. Now, saying that, if I worked for the exam board and I was watching a video from some know-it-all YouTuber claiming this question is unlikely to ever be in the exam, then I know what I'd do. 